All right, so this, this problem here, guys, is a very typical work energy theorem type of a question, okay? Work is being done, and then the energy that was transferred as a result of that work is going to be used to do something else, okay? Now, from what we learned last week, if I do 100 joules worth of work, the system I do that work on can only do how much work? 100 joules, okay? So that means that any part of that system, or all the parts of that system, all their energies would only add up then to 100 joules, okay? All right, so in this question here, I have a rubber band that is stretched 0.85 meters by a force of 60 newtons. Okay, what two things did they just give me? And force and distance, right? Newtons is force, okay? So anytime you see newtons, that's force, okay? So they gave me the force, okay? Force is 60 newtons. And they told me that the distance over which that 60 newton force acted was 0.85 meters. So was work being done here? Yes, okay. So that's one of the things we've got to recognize when we see a question like that is, is work actually being done? Because sometimes I give you a big long question like this and the only thing it would be asking you to recognize is that actually no work got done. It would look like there should be lots of work, but there isn't, okay? All right, so we've got force and distance, work was definitely done. Now they're asking, if I stretched back that rubber band and had a ball in it and then let it go, how fast would the ball go? Well, what's the maximum kinetic energy that ball can have? Well, whatever this is, right? Whatever the work done equals, whatever 60 times 0.85 is. Everybody okay with that? All right, so that's gonna be the maximum kinetic energy of the ball. We're gonna assume everything's perfect and all of the work that's done here ends up as kinetic energy in the ball, all right? So essentially then what we're saying is this, work is the change in kinetic energy of the ball. Now, how do I know it's kinetic energy? Right, they ask about how fast it's going, right? And that has to do with kinetic energy. If they asked how high it might travel, then that would be potential. Oh. Little arrow. That's a triangle. It's delta. It means change. EK. My Ks always look like that. EK for kinetic. Okay. So how do I calculate the change in kinetic energy? Delta always means final minus initial. Okay, so one half MVF squared minus one half MVI squared, right? Because that's the formula for kinetic energy, one half MV squared. All right, so I've got that, and I've got over here, how do I calculate work? Force times distance. Okay, so the work that's done in stretching the rubber band is gonna equal the change in kinetic energy. Now, how much kinetic energy does this ball have when I'm holding the rubber band? Zero, because it isn't moving. All the energy is potential elastic energy in the rubber band. It doesn't have any for the ball yet. So what can I do with this part of the equation here? Get rid of it, because if it's the initial velocity of the ball is zero. For most questions, but not always. I mean, sometimes there is an initial. It doesn't really change what, you just can't make this zero. You actually have to do the subtraction then, right? You fill in, you figure out what this is, figure out what this is and subtract them. And then I'd probably be asking you to calculate force, something like that, okay? We'll probably get to one where it's like that. Okay, so I have the mass of the ball. Sorry, I didn't write down all the givens here. The mass of the ball is 0.125 kilograms, okay? And, um, that's the, sorry, the only other piece of information we have. So we're looking for how fast the ball is going to leave the rubber band. That's VF. So how do I get VF by itself? Right, divide half of M over to the other side, right? Because all, all of those things are being multiplied. Okay, now that gives me VF squared. I only want VF, so what do I have to do? Square root, okay? So that'll be my new formula, okay? The, in order to calculate the speed the ball will leave the rubber band, I'm gonna take the work done, divided by half the mass, and square root that 
to get VF. Okay, and this you on your calculator you want to use brackets here. Okay, so we got um, 60 times 0.85 on the top, 60 newtons times 0.85 meters. Okay, divided by one half times the mass of the ball, which was 0.125. Okay, everybody with me so far? Don't be afraid to say no if you're not. Okay, so when we punch this in, okay, so um, I would say you can do this all in one step if you want, like, and you're going to be really, really good with your brackets. Okay, you could go uh, 60 times 0.85 and then close that up and then divide it by what's on the bottom, 0 0.5 times 0 0.125, bracket, bracket. Okay, you could do it all in one step or you could figure out what that part is, divide it by what that part is and then square root that. Either way, you'll get the same answer. Because I wanna square root everything. If I don't use a double bracket, it would only square root this first part. Yeah, does that make sense? All right, so. The ball is going to come off of the rubber band at 28.6 meters per second. This is exactly why your parents and teachers when you were younger said don't shoot things with rubber bands. They'll take out someone's eye. That would definitely do that. Okay? Because 28 meters per second is over 100 kilometers an hour. Okay? Well, because I was solving for VF. V is speed, right? It has to be in meters per second. Yes, here's why. Remember we went over the, the units for a joule? A joule is a kilogram meter squared per second squared? Yeah. yeah, that's where I got. So I divided, okay, in a Newton. Okay, so you don't necessarily need to know what I'm talking about here, but I'm just going to show, okay? So the units for force are kilogram meters per second squared. I multiplied that by meters. That's why I got joules on the top, right? Okay, so I've got kilogram meters squared per second squared on the top, and I'm dividing by mass, right? If I divide kilogram meters squared per second squared by kilograms, I get meters squared per second squared, which is why we took the square root meters per second. Yeah? If that confused you, forget I said anything. Just remember that we solve for a speed, and speed will be in meters per second. Everyone okay with that? All the way? Yep. Yes. Yes. That's why that we expanded it. We started with this formula saying works a change in kinetic energy. Right? Because that's what we saw in the question. I stretched a rubber band and I used it to shoot a ball. So I was doing work in order to give kinetic energy to a ball. Right? So that's kind of what this statement says. Then I need to expand that because I know I was looking for certain parts of the kinetic energy of the ball, namely its speed. Okay? So what I did is just expanded this out and said, the change in kinetic energy means final minus initial. And then we decided the initial was zero because it wasn't moving when it was sitting in the rubber band. So we canceled that. Okay. Um, we put it in the formula for work, force times distance. And the reason we did that is because that's what we were given here. Okay. If a question was really easy, it would have said, there's this many joules of work done, and I would have just put a number here. Right. But this one made me calculate it. You okay with that? Okay. Then I moved um, what I needed to over here to solve for what the question asked. So there's the initial kind of statement. There's an expansion of that statement. Then there's manipulation and solving. If you want to do it in different steps, that's fine. That would be the same thing, because that's essentially what I did, right? I did find out what work was right here when I was working in that formula, right? But I generally don't like to do part of a calculation if I know I'm going to have to do a big calculation. I don't like to do a part of it because then I forget what I've done. So I, I like to put it all together. If it makes more sense to you to do it piece at a time, 
do it a piece at a time. Okay, everybody, everybody encounters math differently, right? Um, why couldn't you just stick to like that last formula since you already were given part of the formula? Since you're working the whole time for it, you're like, okay, you can stick to that. But how would you know that's what you were getting to? Like, I, I, we had to work to that. That formula isn't on your formula sheet anywhere. This well, is a common. Don't memorize it. Formula. Don't memorize it. No, no don't. You, you've got way too many formulas to memorize them. You'll memorize them wrong. You're better off to, to do the algebra each time. Okay? Because, I mean, like, there's only a few formulas in this unit. You look at your formula sheet. What, there's 15 on there? Something like that? Huh? 17? Oh, something like that? Okay. You get to physics 20, your physics sheet, your physics formula sheet is two-sided. Physics 30, you get a booklet for the diploma exam. That booklet is 20 pages. Okay, it's too dangerous to manipulate and, or sorry, to memorize every single manipulation. It's better to know those three rules and get there. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions on that one? This one here? Yeah. That's on my formula sheet. Works a change in energy. All I had to decide was, was it kinetic energy or potential energy, right? And I just got that from the context of the question. It said, how fast is the ball going? So I knew it was going to be about kinetic energy, okay? So this one here, this is the work energy theorem, right? Work is a change in energy. That's the work energy theorem. I can write that anytime I want. Okay. Right, one half mv squared, right. Okay, no question. Yes, like I, I could say this and have the question say, uh, the ball is aimed straight in the air. What would the maximum height of the ball be? Then that would be a potential energy question. Okay. So FB is? Yes, yeah, there's more than one way to calculate work, okay? Work is a change in energy, okay? Strictly speaking, it's a change in mechanical energy, but in science 10, we separated it. it's either potential or kinetic. And work is done when a force is exerted over a distance, right? So this is always true. Force times distance equals the change in energy, okay? And every work energy theorem problem you do basically starts with that, okay? Same thing. How is that same thing? Because, because when, when, with time, we don't usually write final time minus initial time. We just kind of know how long it takes, right? So we just write, okay. Strictly speaking, if you, like on your physics 30 diploma exam, this formula is on your formula sheet, but it's written like this. Delta V over delta T, change in velocity over change in time. We just usually write it like this. It means the same thing. Right? This is time, like total. Okay. All right. Let's try this one. Okay. Write this one down, and we'll give it a try. The first step with any work energy theorem question is that you want to figure out what kind of energy is being changed. Okay, so in this question, we have a tractor that's pushing a rock from rest to a speed of four meters per second. Is there any mention of a change in height? Okay, so this is what kind of energy that's changing here? Kinetic, it's accelerating the rock. Okay, so we know that the start of this question is going to be that work is a change in kinetic energy, same as it was for the last one. Okay, so change in kinetic energy. Now, the question wants us to calculate the force exerted. Okay, well, the givens in this question are mass, 550 kilograms. Okay, um, the distance, 25 meters. Okay, and the final and initial speeds. Okay, so that's what we know. So if I want to calculate force, am I probably going to have to use force times distance to calculate work? Yes. Now, we just said that 
the work done is changing the kinetic energy of the rock. So that's going to mean then one half MVF squared, the final kinetic energy, minus the initial kinetic energy. But do I need to write that part of it? No, it's zero. Okay, it said the rock was at rest initially, which means it had no kinetic energy. Right? Its final kinetic energy is all due to the fact that the tractor is pushing it. Okay, everybody all right with that? All right, so I'm trying to find the force that the tractor exerts. How do I get force by itself? Divide both sides by D, all right? Okay, so now I've got force isolated. Now I can just plug in and solve. Okay, so again, just quick review here. Steps are, write down your givens. Decide what kind of energy is being changed and set up the work as a change in energy formula for that kind. Okay, so that's what we've done. Now we're manipulating and solving. Okay, so force will equal one half times 550 kilograms times the uh, final speed, which is four squared. Okay, divided by the total distance, which is 25. Okay, everybody with me so far? So I, again, I identified that the tractor was changing the kinetic energy of the rock. Okay, I realized that the initial kinetic energy of the rock was zero. Okay, because it wasn't moving, it said it was initially at rest. And then I manipulated to find the force because that's what the question was asking for. Yep. You could. Uh, no, you couldn't. You don't have time. Yeah, in physics 20, you'd be able to do it because you have more acceleration formulas, ones that involve distance without time. But in science 10, you can't. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I know where you're going with that. And a lot of people do that when I when we do work energy theorem in physics 20. And it takes a lot longer that way. This is actually a much shorter way. Okay. In fact, one of the demonstrations I do is to solve the same question both ways in physics 20. I can solve it this way in under a minute. But it takes me three or four minutes to solve it the other way just because there's a lot more steps. Right? Like you were saying, I could calculate the acceleration. Yes, you could. And then you do this. And then you do that. And there's a lot more steps. Okay. All right. So when we're plugging this in, okay, we're going to have 0. 0.5 times 550 times 4 squared. All right. So that's the top. Divide that by 25. All right. So the tractor is going to use 176 newtons worth of force. This is obviously the perfect physical world where there's no friction or anything like that because a tractor would use a lot more force than that. That's less, that's like one fifth of my weight. So if I stood on your chest, you'd, you'd feel five times more force than the tractor, right? It doesn't make much sense. But. Okay, so, uh, sorry, we said that was gonna be 120, or sorry, 176 newtons. Okay, and guys, I, I know we didn't talk about this part of it very much, but the units for force are newtons. Okay, so anytime you see an N after a number to do with work and energy, it means newtons. That's just the units for, for force. Okay, everyone follow what we did there. All right? Is there a whole lot of math here? Not really. Okay, there really isn't a lot of math. Most of the work energy theorem is intuitive. Okay, that is, I have to look at the question and figure out what kind of energy is being changed, look at what I'm given, how am I going to get force and distance in with that kind of energy? Okay, and then, then you got a little bit of math after that. Okay, any other questions on that one? All right. I'm going to give you guys a chance to try this one. It might have a different kind of energy involved. Spoiler alert, it does. All right, so I'm being asked to find work, right? So I'm not even going to have to use really like force times distance here, am I? I'm being asked to calculate work. What kind of energy is changing here? Potential. Okay, so the formula for potential energy is M times G times H. Agreed? All right, so work is going to equal the change in potential energy, which means M times G times H minus M times G times HI. 
Do I have M? Do I have G? Yes. Do I have both H's? Okay. So I can calculate the work. I don't need to worry about the force times distance part. I wasn't given force or distance. Well, I was sort of given distance, but okay. Um, I don't need to worry about those. The question didn't ask for either one, just asked for work. So all I have to do is calculate the change in potential energy. Okay. So work is going to be then, okay, uh, it was a 10 kilogram package. So 10 times 9.81 times 30, right? I'm sorry, 100, okay, um, minus 10 times 9.81 times 30, okay? In actual fact, you could go 10 times 9.81 times 70 and get the answer straight away, okay? But either way is fine. Whoop. Okay, so we'll have our 10 times 9.81 times 100 minus uh, 10 times 9.81 times 30. All right, so this mail carrier does 6,867 joules worth of work in carrying a 10 kilogram package to the top of the stairs. So wait, why did you, have, why did you get rid of potential energy? I didn't get rid of potential energy. I found the final potential energy, okay? This is the final potential energy, how much it had when it was at 100 meters. And this was the initial potential energy, how much it had at 30. Well, no, sorry. I have the change of potential right here, right? This is this is the change in EP. Final, or sorry, final minus initial. Okay, the formula for potential energy is mass times gravity times height, right? So if I go mass times gravity times final height minus mass times gravity times initial height, I'm calculating the change in potential energy. Okay, Brooklyn? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, you would. You can't do that with with kinetic though. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Don't. So don't try that by subtracting the speeds because it doesn't work because that's squared. Right. Works for this one. Yes. Oh, that's acceleration due to gravity on Earth. Right. So it's unless you're told otherwise, g is always nine point eight one. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Any other questions on that one? So again, how much of this was intuitive and how much of it was math? Mostly intuitive, right? It was very little math here. It was multiplying and subtracting, and that was it. Okay, and that's the way work energy theorem is. Okay, there's a lot of intuitive stuff. Okay, and not actually a lot of calculation, but that makes them difficult sometimes because we really got to read into a question. Okay, this is where reading comprehension and physics meet. Okay, and that becomes really, really important because in physics 30, okay, like last semester on the diploma exam, I think I told you guys this the students had to read two pages of material to answer two questions, okay, on a 50 question test, okay? Like it was ridiculous. There was so much stuff in the reading that was completely extraneous. They didn't need it at all, okay? But they had to read through two pages of stuff to answer two questions, okay? It's important, it's an important skill for you to be able to ascertain from a, from a, Piece of reading, what is important? Yep. Uh, one of them was quite involved and the other was very short. Um, the one that was very short was not, ironically. The one that was very involved was just involved, but the steps were all very easy. Yeah. Uh, Jules. Because work and energy are always in joules. I, I wish I had a better answer than that, but and the units for energy are joules. And since work is a change in energy, it also has to be in joules, right? Because we're talking about subtracting joules from joules. Work and energy are both joules. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions on that one? I know guys, at first this stuff is kind of, it's pretty confusing because you've never really had to do this much intuitive stuff before. And that's why we spend so much time on it. Like I said, it's the most important concept. It's also one of the tougher ones, not mathematically. Okay? It's quite easy mathematically. Okay. 
write that one down and give it a try. You've done one just like this one already. So this one should go, I think, pretty easy. All right. What kind of energy is changing? Kinetic. Okay. So let's write down first off that the work being done by the bulldozer is going to cause a change in the kinetic energy of the truck. Everybody all right with that? Okay. Let's look at what we're given in this question then. Okay. So a bulldozer does 7,500 joules of work in pushing this truck. So what did we just get there? Yeah, we got W, so we don't even have to worry about force and distance. They gave us what force times distance equals. Okay, so that'll make our life a little bit easier. Okay, 7,500 joules. All right, um, so it pushes the truck from a speed of two meters per second to an unknown speed. So VI is two meters per second and VF is unknown. Okay, if the truck has a mass of 2,500 kilograms, what's its final speed? All right, so that's what I'm given. And we just said that the work is changing the kinetic energy of the truck. So my next step is I'm gonna expand out this delta EK part, All right? I'm gonna say that work equals EK final minus EK initial, okay? And then I can put in my formulas if I want, All right? But at this point, what I need to think about is, can I calculate both of those right now? I don't have VF, so I can't calculate this, but I do have VI. Since I'm looking for VF, can I bring EK over here? The, the initial one, sorry. Can I bring it over here? Yes, okay. How would I bring it over here? Adding it. So work plus the initial kinetic energy will give me the final kinetic energy, and that should make sense, right? The final kinetic should be whatever I had to begin with plus however much work was done. Everybody okay with that idea? Okay, so now I'm gonna put in my formulas and my numbers, okay? So for the work, it's gonna be 7,500 joules plus one half times um, 2,500 kilograms, the mass of the truck, times its initial velocity, or initial speed, two, okay? And that's gonna equal one half times 2,500 times um, VF squared. So the only thing I don't know is VF squared. So how do I get VF squared by itself? Well, I don't want to square it yet. I got to move something first. Can I move this and this over to that side? Okay, since I'm multiplying them all, how do I get them over here? Divide, right? So I'm just dividing by half of them, right? Okay, that gets me VF squared. I want VF. So I'm going to, okay, this is just like the first one we did, except there was actually an initial velocity this time. Okay. That's, that's what's different. All right. So when we plug in our numbers here, okay, if we're taking our work, 7,500 joules, and we're subtracting the initial, or sorry, adding the initial kinetic energy. All right, so that's my final kinetic energy, 12,500 joules. Now I'm gonna divide that by this. All right, that's my speed squared. I want square root of that. 3.16 meters per second, okay. have basically all of these questions started out the same. That's what we got to get, okay? The work energy theorem is always the same. It's work equals whatever energy is changing. And then you're going to have to, that's the, the intuitive part comes after that. The intuitive part is, what do I have to move around? What was I given, okay? What do I have to find? That takes a little bit of practice. Because I thought people would get confused if I had all the letters in there when I was subtracting all the letters together. I thought this looked simpler. 
Okay. So it could also look like this. Work equals uh, one half MVF uh, squared minus one half MVI squared. And then I just add this. So I go work plus one half MVI squared equals one half MVF squared. I just thought with all those letters that that might be more confusing for people. So I just moved the whole term instead. Okay. Same thing. Mathematically, same thing. You only have to square root if you're looking for one of the v's, okay? Because it's the only thing in the formula that's squared, right? So if you're looking for something and in a formula it's squared, you'll have to square root to get it, but only for the v's. H, you don't have to do it or anything else. Yeah? Yes, I have to square root everything, okay? So, I mean, if you don't want to worry about all the brackets, you could do what I did, which was I did this, 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 and then square rooted the answer at the end, rather than have to bracket everything and worry about punching it in wrong. Yeah. Okay, I know this is tough the first time through guys, why we spend quite a bit of time on it. Okay. Any other questions on that one? Okay. So here's kind of the steps. This isn't in your notes, so you might want to write it down. Okay, solving work energy theorem questions. Okay, obviously your first thing is write out your givens. Okay, what, what does the question tell you? Force, distance, does it actually just give you work? Okay, is it giving you speeds or heights? Okay, things like that. Does it give you mass? Hopefully it does, because that's usually one of the important things. Okay. Once you have the givens written down, then obviously you wanna identify it as a work energy theorem question. Okay, so work is a change in energy or force times distance is a change in energy, okay? Okay, once you have the givens written out, then, like we said, you got to figure out which kind of energy is changing. Is it kinetic? If it is, it's one half mv squared minus one half mv squared. Okay. If it's potential, then it's mghf minus mghi. Okay. Um, setting it up that way. So that's actually kind of steps one and two. Okay, we'll set up our work energy theorem once we've decided whether we're dealing with a change in kinetic energy like here on the left, okay, or a change in potential energy like here on the right. Okay, once we've plugged in our formulas, then we manipulate for whatever thing the question asks for and solve. Okay, so by manipulate and solve, I mean, all right, I have to find the uh, you know, final height of the object. So I'm going to add MGHI over here and then divide by MG and go from there. You're right. Yeah, because elastic potential energy works different. This is gravitational potential energy. Okay. Um, you don't learn about elastic until physics 20, but it has to do with the stiffness of the rubber band or spring or whatever elastic object, this is called the spring constant. It's how many Newtons you need per meter. And, and X is actually displacement from equilibrium or from its non-strained length, right? So it's a, it looks kind of like the, the, the kinetic energy formula, but okay, that's how we do for potential elastic, but we don't do elastic potential in, in science 10 at all. We just focus on the, okay. in the end, it's still this formula. It's just a derivation of force and distance, right? If I pull on a rubber band, I, I'm exerting a force over a distance. It's still the same idea, right? Even this formula is force times distance, okay? The force of gravity is mass times the acceleration due to gravity, right? Height is just a vertical distance. So really when I go M times G times H, I'm going the force of gravity times distance, it's still force times distance. Okay, so those are kind of the steps that when I've, I've followed those steps to the letter on every single question we've done thus far. Okay, so give that one a try. We've got a heavy box being pushed up a hill, okay, by a force of 150 newtons over a distance of 25 meters. Now, just a reminder here, okay, we went over uh, a diagram like this where we had a guy who was lifting a box to the top of a ramp and a person who was pushing it up the ramp. And what did we say was true about the work for both? It was the same, okay? So 
when you're pushing something up a ramp, you're changing its height, which means you're changing its what kind of energy? Its potential. Okay. Since it doesn't mention about accelerating the object, we're assuming it's a constant velocity. Therefore, there's no change in kinetic energy. Okay. This is strictly a change in potential energy question. Okay. That should give you a good start on that one. All right. Let's have a look at this one. Okay, so we got this heavy box that's 35 kilograms, okay, it's about 75 or 80 pounds, okay, um, is pushed up a hill by this force of 150 newtons. Okay, so, so far what we know is mass, 35 kilograms, okay, we know the force is 150 newtons, okay, and we know that the hill or the distance is 25 meters long, but that means it's 25 meters on this side, the change in height is here. Everybody okay with that? Okay, so that's kind of the, the difference there. All right, um, what kind of energy did we say was changing? Potential, all right, sorry, still got some stuff going on here. All right, so that means that the work being done here is changing the gravitational potential energy of the box. What's the other formula for work? FD, all right, force times distance. And I have both of those things, that's why I wanna have it there, okay? Potential energy, okay, or the change in potential energy means the final potential minus the initial potential. Nobody, you're busy. Okay, um, are either of these zero? The initial is because we're at the bottom of the hill to start with, okay. So I can get rid of that. Now, I'm just looking for how much higher the box is at the top of the hill. Would that be the final height of the box? Yes, it would. All right, so how do I get HF by itself? Just divide mg over to this side, right? That'll leave me with HF. All, right, all I have to do now is plug in my numbers. So I take my 150 Newton force, multiply that by the distance over which that 150 Newtons acted, 25 meters, Okay, and then divide that by um, the mass, 35, times gravity, 9.81. Okay, so we have our 100, whoop, it's got to be on, 150 times 25. Okay, so there's the amount of work done or the change in the potential energy. Okay, and then I'm dividing that by 35 times 9.81. All right, so we're looking at 10.9 meters. Did you remember the bracket part? Okay, so I went 150 times 25, right? Force times distance, that gave me the change in energy. Then I divide that by essentially the force of gravity, okay? And I get the distance vertically, okay? So where we're going with this, guys, is this, okay? When we looked at that diagram the other day, the girl who pushed the rock up the ramp used less force over a greater distance, okay? The person who lifts the rock uses a much greater force over a shorter distance, okay? Everybody kind of follow there? All right. All right. Um, any other questions on that one? David? No, even if there's friction, it's still easier to go up a ramp than it is to lift something directly. Unless the ramp is so incredibly thick with friction that it, yeah. But no one would build a ramp that way because that defeats the purpose of a ramp. Yep. Or I'd give you the incline of the hill and say it's accelerated up the ramp so there'd be a change in both potential and kinetic. Okay. Which isn't as hard as I just made it sound, but yeah. All right, is this starting to make a little bit more sense? Are we starting to kind of see what's going on? Even if we're not always getting the right answer, are we kind of seeing what's going on with the pattern here? Okay. Right here. Okay, I crossed it off right here because we started at the bottom of the hill, so HI would have been zero, which means M times G times zero is zero. So all I would have been doing is subtracting zero, and there's no point in doing that, right? having all these extra letters in my formula. 
So I just get rid of it. Does that make a little more sense? I know it never said that anywhere and someone asked. So I said, no, if you're, if you're not told otherwise, always assume if a hill's involved, you start at the bottom. Does that make sense, Nick? Okay, so we started at the bottom, which means we had no potential energy because you can't fall from the bottom of a hill. Okay. All right. Okay, this I think will be our last one. Give this one a try. It's a kinetic energy one, okay? 